Welcome to the Zafi for Friday, May 29th. And today we're going to be talking to Thomas Lukasik, who is a cabinet minister under uh, Ellison Redford and Ed Stelmack, and even under Ralph Klein. So he knows about energy politics and, uh, and relations with uh, the Canadian government and so on. So we're talking about that. So welcome to the Zafi, Thomas. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So before we get, we get going with this, I wanna, I'm going to be publishing a column today that talks, that analyzes the decision by the Norges Bank, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, to divest itself from four Alberta uh, oil sands companies. This happened a couple of weeks ago. And the response from the company and from Premier Kenny and from business leaders was to call the Norges Bank hypocrites and to, you know, sort of lambaste them in the, in the media. And what I found, and it's taken me two weeks to do all the work, I interviewed uh, the Norges Bank, I interviewed the, the Council of Ethics, which is the group of experts that gives advice to the Norges Bank. I interviewed, uh, I read the report from Cicero, which is the Norwegian Climate Institute, which provided advice to the Council on Ethics. This is a really complex issue. And what, you've, what I found was that the Norges Bank and the Council of Ethics went through a very rigorous uh, process for evaluating the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the Alberta oil sands, and it looked at the, um, at the policy framework, uh, the climate policy framework within Alberta. It looked at the company's plans to reduce both emission intensity and absolute emissions, and that is critical. It's the absolute emissions that really count here, not the emissions intensity, which is what the companies and the government focus on. And what I found was that this is a very methodical, intentional, well thought out process and a conclusion that was, is almost inevitable, which is that the Alberta oil sands from Nor Norway's point of view uh, is too risky. It, uh, there's too much climate risk attached to it. And climate risk, as we all know from Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock Inc's letter from mid-January, Climate risk is now affecting the allocation of capital around the world, but particularly in the oil and gas industry. So how the industry, and particularly how Premier Kenny responded to this, was, in my opinion, really inappropriate. It's the wrong narrative. It's the wrong approach to politics. And you can take this one anecdote, this one example, and you can apply it over dozens and dozens and dozens of examples over the last year in government and the last two and a half years that the Kenny has been head of the UCP. And what it does is led it to the current disaster where nothing has worked. There is, not, there is almost nothing the Kenny government has done that you can point to that has actually helped the industry and brought anything back, brought jobs back, brought investment back, brought confidence back, none of that. And so the evidence on the face of it is that Jason Kenny and the UCP are the worst energy policy and politics managers in the history of Alberta. That's my argument. Thomas, I'm going to turn it over to you for a response. <laughs> well, um, that's a great condemnation. Um, you know, the, the issue is very complex and, and there are layers upon layers of, uh, of, uh, of, of matters that we should be discussing. Number one, you know, the sort of the most overarching one, um, Jason Kenney has a problem that is no different from what Jim Prentice had. Um, federal uh, cabinet ministers uh, don't do very well in provincial politics, period. Um, it's a different world. Uh, politics is much more local provincially, and, and you will find that uh, their messaging uh, disconnects. Their read on the population uh, is, 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 uh, is, is not good. Uh, but that's more of an of a overarching comment, and we could get into that one other day. The problem Kenny has is that he has a touring uh, circus. Uh, one is the international investment market. Um, those are individuals like Norges Bank, uh, who are very well equipped uh, with data, uh, who are making pragmatic uh, decisions uh, based on trends, investment returns on investment, and, and other factors. And then he has his political audience to which he has to play in order to be uh, re-elected. Uh, Kenny uh, put himself in a very difficult position because of his rather populist approach to politics, whereas uh, that is based on telling people what they want to hear and not always what, what bears in facts. Uh, 
So now he has to deliver two divergent messages. One is, is the factual one that Norges Bank is telling us that we are out of line, we're not in tune with, with investment trends and, and consumer trends, and that we are becoming uh, a little bit of a rogue uh, in the world market, or, or as uh, Premier Notley, uh, I believe it was, I don't want to put words into her mouth, but says sort of the embarrassing cousin of, of the industry. Uh, and on the other hand, he has this large number of voters and UCP members and, and donors who expect him to get angry, uh, who expect him to fight for Alberta uh, and, and, and show vocal uh, leadership um, in, in a sense uh, that uh, showing that what Alberta is doing, there's nothing to be ashamed of. We're the right guys. Uh, the world is off keel. So, so you have this dilemma that he found himself in. And unfortunately, in the world of, of uh, instantaneous communication, whatever he tells one audience, the other one hears it. But notice that that same split actually occurs within Alberta. Uh, uh, our oil and gas industry actually is divided into another sub two ring circus. And that is the large producers versus the medium and small size producers. Uh, when you deal with oil sands and the large producers, they're very much in tune with what you hear from Norges Bank. Uh, they are promoters of carbon tax, and uh, and you don't see him see that industry being outraged and screaming and shouting. Whereas uh, the smaller producers, um, who in the numbers of people and voters and and for, and donations to UCP party, uh, compose a much larger group. Uh, that is the group that is suffering right now. Uh, there's no doubt about it, and that is the group that is pushing Kenny and all his MLAs. Um, to to become fighters to stand up for Alberta, so uh, it's it's of his own doing. I, I don't feel sorry for him as a politician because he chose to take that path. Um, as you recall, uh, Premier Alison Redford uh, chose to take a different path, more similar to what Premier Alice, uh, Rachel Notley did, and she talked about um, uh, having a license social license to produce, that did not resonate well uh, with the small and medium-sized producers because they saw it as some kind of a, um, a, some kind of a, a value judgment on them not being socially responsible in the way they produce. And we all saw the results of what happened to, uh, um, to Alison Redford on that particular file. So Kenny is taking the opposite way. Uh, uh, he is gaining votes among his uh, populist supporters but in a, on a world stage, uh, we, are, we are diverging further and further um, from other oil producing jurisdictions. You know, obviously, not the ones in, 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 in totalitarian regimes where polling and, and consumer trends don't matter as much, but uh, from developed uh, uh, democratic uh, oil producers. Okay, let's, let's, there's a lot to unpack there. And uh, so I'm, we're going to go through some of this. So uh, I've been arguing for the last two, two and a half years that in fact, uh, after the uh, climate leadership plan was introduced on November 22nd, 2015, that, and that was supported. And in fact, there was a whole process that I won't go through. You can read it in my, in my book and in my column, many columns about it. But the, there were four, four uh, oil sand CEOs that stood on the stage with, with Rachel Notley. And so Steve Williams from Suncor and, and, right. um, and uh, the three others, Lorraine Mitchell Moore from Shell Canada and Murray Edwards from CNRL and so on. So they were behind that 100%. And what that did is it set off a civil war inside the industry with the little guys and the medium guys and the service company against the big oil sands companies. And I interviewed Tim McMillan from CAP. And when I asked him about this, he, you should have heard the tension in his voice when he made it really abundantly clear to me that CAP had nothing to do with that, the, and most it was five oil sands companies by themselves on their own didn't represent industry eye-opening comments so but then something happened you saw brian ferguson from sonovas retire you saw steve williams and lorraine mitchell moore and murray edwards kind of step back a bit from from cnrl that leadership that leadership group of visionary ceos and you know and, and well i guess murray's a chairman they, back, they backed away, and a new group of CEOs took place, of which Alex Bourbe at Sonovus is one. And when you saw, when Norges made its uh, announcement, what did Bourbe said? He came out and he said it was cheap climate points, 
and it was they're hypocrites and he was as bad as Kenny was. And I think what's happened, part of the problem here is that the those CEOs at that level have taken a step back and are now more regressive than their, their predecessors were. And I think that's a serious problem. They're now actually a little more aligned with the small producers than they were before. And that has uh, only exacerbated the problem with what Kenny is doing and where Kenny is doing going because now he has more support than he would have had, say, four or five years if he had tried this, this stuff. So your response, Thomas. Well, these companies are pragmatic and, and, and they adapt to the political climate of whatever country they, they operate in. And, and Kenny has set a very clear agenda uh, that he is going to oppose um, uh, those trends. As you know, the Norwegian bank statements and decision uh, is the last one in a chain of decisions. There were other investment houses um, and credit rating agencies uh, that came up uh, with, with similar statements, maybe not as, as pointed as Norges's, uh, but similar. Um, and, and Kenny consistently um, uh, opposed those statements. So, you know, these large players in oil stands, um, they, um, they adapt to the messaging because they have to operate within the political climate of a given uh, country or, or a province. And that is unfortunate, but that's, you know, that's how, that's how business operates. The question is this, uh, what will this do to Alberta's uh, production and our ability to export our product over a long period of time? Um, unfortunately, um, it is easier um, to, to destroy one's reputation on a world market than it is to repair it. It takes a long time to repair one's reputation. And, and this is not arguing whether markets are right or wrong. Uh, often markets can be wrong, but the fact is markets always prevail. If, if your consumer doesn't want, you, want, doesn't want to buy your product for good or bad reasons, it doesn't matter, your product is still not being sold. So it, it would be wise of us um, and of Kenny to start paying closer attention to what the consumers uh, are telling him, particularly um, where, where our primary consumer, United States, is, is not as a reliable one as it used to be. See, what, what Kenny is playing is, is, is the politics of, of 1970s, 80s, and maybe even 90s, where we frankly did not have to care about the public, worldwide public opinion about our product. We, we had one, cons one customer um, that, that purchased everything that we had to sell. And, uh, and was quite satisfied with, with the quantity and the quality and the source uh, of our energy. Well, now all of a sudden we have to appeal to a wider market. And, um, and obviously Kenya's government is just not equipped to do that. Uh, they're, still, they're still thinking, they're still in the mentality of, of having one uh, reliable closed market uh, system and that's no longer the case. Yeah, let's talk about markets for a minute, because on the one hand, we think primarily of oil markets or gas markets, but there's another market, and that's the market for capital. And Alberta uh, companies, uh, when you talk to the executives, actually, they will talk about how important it is for them to compete for capital. Well, it's, the, it's that market and it's those customers that are pushing back right now, and that's, and which is really serious because either you can't get capital because the junior producers in, in Alberta cannot get capital, or the capital costs a lot of money and the, and the cost of capital can actually make a project, the difference between a project being economic or not being economic. Okay. So let's, because that's a very good point, Thomas, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. But let's talk about another uh, form of politics that you uh, will know about and then Mark as well. And that is the politics with, within Canada, the politics with the federal government. Because I, I get it, I understand that, you know, uh, the bashing of Trudeau in Alberta is just the best politics you can, you can have. And from an electoral and a, a political point of view, uh, Justin Trudeau was kind of a gift to Jason Kenney. But on the other hand, the way he's played this, at the end of the day, you have to be able to come to the table and you have to be able to compromise and negotiate. And I see a little bit of that, and you saw it around the large emitter uh, carbon tax program from the uh, CCIR under the Notley government, uh, Kenny brings in the, the tier and he compromises on the carbon price at $30 uh, a, a ton. And that's the, the compromise with Trudeau in order to get tier recognized as equivalent to the federal 
the federal backstop. So I get that. He's, he's not entirely incompetent on these things. I mean, he was a cabinet minister for many years. But by the same token, the, the, uh, the way his narrative and the way he practices politics with the federal government is, is can't help but, but alienate more Canadians than it appeals to. And ultimately, that narrative is going to erode the support for Alberta and its hydrocarbon ambitions uh, within the body politic, and especially when it comes to climate policy. Because if any, we know anything that's coming out of last year's federal election is the, the minority federal, liberal government supported by the NDP and the Greens are bringing in more strict climate policy, and a lot of it is aimed squarely at Alberta and its hydrocarbon economy. And Alberta has to have a response that will allow it to adapt and, and work through the, the, uh, what's coming down the pipe in terms of policy. So I would posit to you, sir, that in fact, Jason Kenney has done a, a very poor job in managing his politics within Canada and with the federal government. Your response. Well, this friction between uh, Edmonton and Ottawa is, is long-lasting, um, but sometimes it wasn't real. I will I recall a time uh, during Premier Klein's uh, years when uh, uh, Jean Chrétien was uh, the Prime Minister of, of Canada. There was this, uh, uh, for show purposes, uh, a fight going on between the two, and, and uh, it wasn't a good week if, if Ralph didn't punch Chrétien or Chrétien didn't punch him back. But I can tell you uh, for a fact, because I, I've been uh, part to some of these uh, uh, meetings, uh, there were no two better friends in Canadian politics on a personal level than Ralph Klein and, and uh, Jean Chrétien. They had a favorite restaurant in Calgary at which they would, uh, um, they would taste uh, a variety of, of, of different wines and, and, and beers and actually enjoy each other's company. But they knew that for political purposes, uh, it served them both well to be uh, on, a, on, a, on a political stage, public stage, uh, adversaries. Unfortunately, what we're seeing right now um, is, is not for show purposes. Um, this is uh, a real animosity uh, between the Premier of Alberta and, um, and, and Justin Trudeau. We haven't seen much by way of punching back uh, verbally um, uh, from, from federal government. Um, but building those relationships, again, um, it will be rather difficult. Now, Alberta, again, uh, has placed itself as a somewhat of an outlier on a number of, of federal issues um, and, and fanning the flames with, you know, with rejuvenating the firewall concepts of separating from CPP and, and, and other moves. That does not make it for a healthy relationship, particularly at a time when you're hoping um, to convince um, Canadians from coast to coast to coast on some important files for Alberta, uh, such as uh, emissions and, and, and energy re related policy. It makes me always wonder why would you start other fires uh, at that time and aggravate uh, the rest of Canada and particularly political leaders uh, across, uh, across uh, the scope. Um, but that's, that's the nature of, of Jason Kenney. He doesn't back down. Uh, there, there are some uh, personal uh, uh, feelings between him and, and, and Prime Minister Trudeau. That's, that's very obvious. And, and I don't see that, that going away. Unfortunately, um, this doesn't bear well for, for Alberta. Um, Alberta has always been somewhat of an outlier, a, a number of policies, and, and this divide uh, seems to grow. And, and the recent poll, actually, uh, on popularity on, of premiers across Canada uh, was very interesting because our premier didn't receive a bump uh, in popularity in COVID. And, and I think that there is much more to be read uh, into that bump. Um, the fact that he didn't receive a, a bump speaks to the fact that uh, he is starting to distance Albertans. Uh, Albertans are starting to, to, to notice that um, he is detached from, from mainstream uh, thinking in this province, and, and, and there is a concern uh, relevant to how we are positioning ourselves against the rest of the country and, and the rest of the world. So even though I will be the first one to tell you that I think he handled COVID uh, quite well, quite effectively, uh, the numbers, data speak to it, 
and and I think the government acted rather rather competently on this file. This did not translate into any popularity growth because there are larger overarching concerns about where will Alberta be when other provinces and other countries are recovering from COVID. Uh, what are we left with? Uh, what how much baggage did we create? Um, perhaps in part uh, to ourselves by ourselves. So. Um, again, uh, he he is in a in a in a political quandary, and and that also stems from the fact that he uh, came to power to through the stages of leadership races, and in the last election on on very populist messaging, and and now uh, starting to change his tone and and starting to speak to facts and data and and and, and figures. Uh, would make him seem uh, like uh, retracting uh, back to maybe Rachel Notley, Alison Redford, and, and Prentice and other messages, and, and he clearly doesn't want to be that. He wants to be um, he wants to be that premier that that came in and 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 said the, the, the hell with the rest of the world, the hell with Canada. Uh, if we can't get it done our way, we will separate. And 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 his base expects that rhetoric to continue in one format or, or another. Very difficult position. One thing to watch is what happens uh, within the UCP caucus, because you know being a premier is one thing, but getting reelected, particularly as a private member, as a backbench MLA, is another. Um, and and I'm sensing that um, his MLAs are starting to feel the heat, starting to feel the pressure, and by this time must be wondering um, whether they can get themselves reelected uh, on this kind of messaging. So. It's interesting, but as interesting as it is, I have to tell you, I'm very concerned about the future of our province vis-a-vis -vis how we positioned ourselves um, uh, juxtaposed against the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Well, uh, this will be our last uh, question that we address, Thomas, and then we'll open it up to, to questions. And when we do that, folks, uh, if you can look at the bottom of your video screen, you see manage, manage participants, you should find a uh, link that you can click that'll put up a little blue hand. When I see the blue hand in my list, I'll know that you want to ask a question, and then I'll call on you to unmute your mic and ask your question. So here's the thing, Thomas. Uh, from the, uh, the federal government's point of view, 716 megaton a year of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. Alberta accounts for 26% of that, accounts for 12% or 11% of the population, 26 27% of greenhouse gas emissions. The oil sands alone account for 11% of those emissions. And there is no way that the Trudeau government meets, comes even close to meeting its 2030 targets or its 2050 targets without, without dealing with Alberta. It just, it cannot happen. The number, the data is very, very clear on that. And what you see in, in Ottawa is the Trudeau government putting in a whole suite of really tough climate policies. And a lot of it is technical stuff like the clean fuel standard that doesn't attract a lot of attention in the public. But behind the scenes, the industry is panicking about it because they know how, how punitive it's going to be on them. And I, so I, I get that. But on the other hand, the only way to cope with this is for the industry and Kenny to say, okay, look, we get it. Climate change is an issue. Uh, the energy transition is an issue. We need to align our policies and our politics with that, and we're going to cooperate as much as possible it, to get there, but still achieve our objectives. And that simply is not happening. And I, I said in one column, do you hear the sucking sound? That's Alberta uh, being sucked under the uh, federal climate change steamroller. It's coming, and it ain't going to be pretty for Alberta or the industry. What do you say, Thomas? Um, I agree. You know, comparing our emission and weighing it against population isn't isn't a good comparison. Uh, probably more so against GDP would be a a more appropriate way to measure it. But the fact is, no matter how you slice it, um, not only the Trudeau government, any subsequent federal government will have to deal with this issue. It's an issue, and it has to be resolved. Now, the question is, how will Alberta position itself? Um, I would suggest that um, uh, having a more collaborative approach with federal government and, and, and saying, we realize that there is a problem that needs to be addressed. How can we do this together uh, over a prolonged period of time uh, in a way that doesn't 
um, that isn't as punitive to our industry and our province as it would be without us cooperating uh, would be would be the more rational the way of approaching it. Um, but there isn't such dialogue going on right now. You know, the, our province uh, uh, on a on a public stage is in denial and refuses to to work um, with the federal government. Um, which will, at the end of the day, have to tilt the federal government's hand because uh, we do have international obligations. And, and as you mentioned, capital, uh, as a country, we're also competing for capital for other industries, not only oil and gas. So, so the prime minister's role um, is, is unique in a sense that he not only represents Alberta, but he represents the rest of Canada and all the other industries in the world, capital markets and, and in political on the political stage. So, so he has to be very measured uh, in his approach and, um, and, and he cannot base our national, pan-national uh, policy uh, based on the needs of one particular province. So, so it, is, it is obvious that changes will have to occur. Um, it is our choice if we're going to participate in those changes and, and be able to influence those changes to make them as, as seamless as possible, or are we going to, to push back and, and force the hand of, if not this prime minister, whoever the next one happens to be, and, and make those changes for us. But, but obviously we can see that this is what we saw from Norges Bank. This wasn't just one off. Uh, there is a trend, a long lasting trend among some of the most serious players in the world market. And, and unless we adapt, um, we disappear. You know, that's, there's, it's no different than, uh, it's, it's natural. Thank, thank you, Thomas. You've just made uh, made my argument for me. I, I appreciate that. Uh, okay, now uh, I would like we're going to open it up to uh, questions uh, from uh, attendees. And uh, Marga, if you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I know you've uh, a couple of chatted, uh, made a couple of chat comments, and uh, given that you were a cabinet minister, and given particularly that you were the energy minister from 2015 to 2019, I'm, if you will, I'm very interested in your comments and your perspective on this. So, uh, so if you don't mind, if you, do, you, do you have a, a question or a comment? Um, more a comment. Um, uh, I've been putting in the comments there. I, I totally agree with what Thomas has been saying. And uh, uh, I worry for this government and what it's going to do to our industry if we don't um, get with the next century and uh, and start looking at the the industry is not going away but it needs to um, look and then there are lots of good stories going on right now with technology and uh, you know it can go forward but it it we can't go back to the 50s and 60s attitude for sure um, I you and I had a chat about a week ago I think with the Norges situation and uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone because Statoil sold their assets uh, a few years ago uh, to CNRL and to Athabasca Oil and uh, they've been and Shell as well has uh, reduced some of their assets in the oil sands you know to move in another direction so it shouldn't have been a surprise to this government uh, but I think they just sometimes want to keep their head in the sand and and again appeal to their base but uh, I worry for the future of an industry that's been very good to Alberta and um, you know how uh, who's going to survive out of it and um, I uh, also agreed uh, with Thomas's comment about it'll be interesting to watch in the next while about the caucus in the UCP because I see fragmentation happening there. And uh, so uh, our premier has a, a few fires on his hands right now and it's up to him to show some leadership in the next while. Mark, I, I want to, uh, so I got some information from Norgas and the Council on Ethics that I don't know if you were aware of it, but I'd like to get your response to it. And that is the council actually recommended to, to Norgas that back in 2017 to disinvest from those four companies. And it didn't, and Norgas did not take the recommendation. Didn't take the recommendation because of the climate. Didn't take the recommendation because of the climate leadership. Uh, yeah, I did actually know that. Uh, I met with uh, both the last two ministers uh, in of Norway uh, when I was down in Houston and and uh, I our climate leadership plan was being noticed by the world and especially investors like uh, Norway uh, Norges and uh, and we I met I think I told you that too in one of our conversations I used to meet yearly 
with bankers that would come to Calgary meeting with oil companies and uh, they saw the climate leadership plan as a very positive thing uh, in the investment world because we were putting things into legislation and um, I think Thomas would agree when things are in legislation and in writing uh, that makes investors very happy. And I see a lot of the pulling away of investment right now because of the uncertainty and, uh, and losing the climate leadership plan. So again, um, you know, I think uh, we were making some good progress in that area. And I think Thomas mentioned it's, it's very easy to lose your reputation and it takes a lot of work to bring it back. And I think we were doing a, a good job in bringing the shine back to Alberta and, and the good things that do happen in the industry. Well, before I turn this back over to, to Thomas, I want to make one point is, you know, every, probably everybody here knows about my book, the, the New Alberta Advantage, Technology Policy and the Future of the Oil Sands, which essentially was a, a defense of, a, of the oil sands companies and of the climate leadership plan as a the beginning of a long-term strategy to make the oil sands competitive, both cost and carbon in, in, uh, competitive. And I didn't arrive at that because I have an NDP uh, card in my in my wallet. I arrived at that conclusion because I interviewed over the course of four uh, four years or so many many economists and and industry experts and and uh, climate experts and so on who told me almost to a person that the climate leadership was what was needed. It was the right uh, policy at the right time. It was reasonably well designed. There were some implementation problems from the industry point of view, but those are the sorts of things that can get ironed out. Uh, and that's why I wrote that, that book. And, uh, and I, I think that the uh, events over the past year have borne out the conclusions that I came to in the book. So I just wanted to make the point that this is not just Thomas, the former cabinet minister, and Mark, the former energy minister. This is many experts that I've interviewed who will back up what's being said today in, in the arguments that we're making here. So Thomas, if you want to respond to Mark, please. You know, it, you, you, some would find it unusual that, uh, that a progressive conservative and, and an NDP cabinet ministers would agree on, on certain file, but some of the files um, simply can't be politicized. Uh, information uh, decisions have to be made on best available information. And, and uh, Marg was working off of the same data sheets and, and working with the same uh, cadre of, of civil servants and, 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 and economists and advisors uh, as we were. Uh, and, and unless you allow ideology to play into, uh, into your decision-making process, which, which inevitably in politics, it, it always does to some extent, uh, you will arrive at rather similar uh, conclusions. And um, the biggest arguments uh, or, or discussions that we always had in cabinet on the energy file, and don't forget that I was, uh, I believe I was a minister of labor at that time, at a time when we closed the last coal mine um, in Alberta, um, it was not about the commodity, but about the dollars, the investment. You know, dollars have uh, no allegiance to any jurisdiction, nor do they have any allegiance to any product. And, and I remember often sharing with my cabinet colleagues that, you know, uh, these investment houses, today they invest in oil, tomorrow they will invest in cotton, uh, if it gives them a better return on investment. Uh, these investment houses are not created to fund oil industry, they're invented to, to generate investment, uh, a return on investment. Um, but now more and more, they're driven by shareholders who are holding them to account relevant to what products and what jurisdiction they invest in. Um, and if their shareholders are telling them, we don't want you to invest in certain commodities or in certain jurisdiction or support certain policies, that's what these investment houses will do. And we're seeing this right now. The reason there is a issue, because you know, some of them, uh, let's call them, uh, uh, thinkers uh, of, 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 uh, of the past would say, well, where else are they going to find oil? Or, or um, you know, the oil is here, obviously they will invest over here. Uh, thinking as if those dollars are somehow permanently attached to, to oil, uh, they aren't. And, and the reason we're seeing now uh, a shortage of capital is because uh, shareholders in those banks uh, 
those who deposit their dollars into those banks, and in the case of Norges, the citizens of Norway, uh, are telling um, uh, their administrators, we don't want you to invest in a certain product, certain set of policies, or a certain jurisdiction. And, and that's, that's where the problem is. So simply having enough oil to last you know, uh, for hundreds of years is not enough. Uh, you have to have a set of solidified policies around the extraction of that product that satisfies the shareholders of the investment houses. And, and we can argue till the cows come home whether the shareholders are right or wrong. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, they made a decision, and it's a very consistent decision. It's coming at us from a variety of different investment houses right now, telling us that unless you change your ways and, and put those changes into legislation, um, we are unlikely to invest at the rate that we've been investing before. Yes, I, I would agree with that. And uh, there are all sorts of anecdotes that illustrate that, and you can go if you go to the energy.media uh, website, you, and if you search for Eric Denhoff, E-E-R-I-C, -E -E uh, he was the Deputy Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change under the Notley government. And he, in a couple of columns, describes what it was like in 2018 when he led or participated in a visit to Wall Street and the, American, the big American investment houses and the reception they got where they were told we need a narrative to tell our shareholders about the oil sands. If you don't have right. one for us, we cannot invest in you because our shareholders will rebel. And then they were told about the climate leadership plan and that gave them the narrative that they needed to go back to their, sh their shareholders, go back to their investors and reassure them that Alberta was taking action on climate change. And you just can't stress this enough you know, when you put together the analysis from the experts and the anecdotes from people like Eric and from Thomas and, and Mark, this trend is overwhelming and it ain't going backwards, folks. And Alberta has got to adapt. That is one of the main messages of my journalism. So anyway, Raf, you have a question. If you could unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Hello. Yes, I do have a question. Slightly out of topic, but whatever. That's the opportunity. So uh, hello, Yak Shemash. My question mm -hmm. is the following. Um, so when Jason Kenny went to the office, almost immediately, he put a loophole in the legislation allowing uh, employers not to pay overtime to the workers. I think it's like the most stinky piece of legislation I, uh, I seen in like in concrete <laughs> application because it allows, and I seen it, uh, it allows uh, some of the creepiest employers there is to take the advantage and uh, screw some of the most vulnerable people there is. So this loophole in legislation was removed by NDP, but was in place when you, you were in the office and you were minister of labor. So I, my question is, so obviously where you were chill with that. So my question is, is it okay to pay people over time after 44 hours or is really not necessary? Of course, it's uh, okay. Uh, it varies. It varies from province uh, to province. Uh, labor laws, as you know, change uh, vary from from province to province. Um, you know, I, I will be the first one to tell you uh, that uh, number of of labor policies that we had as government um, were not always perfectly aligned with my individual thinking. Um, um, not on both sides of the of the political spectrum, but the fact is, and, and maybe uh, Marg uh, will back me up on this one. Uh, as a cabinet minister, uh, you are one member of cabinet, and um, and any policy you put through, any regulation or any bill you put through, you first have to run it through cabinet, and and have a vote in cabinet and have the approval of the cabinet. Our system uh, in Canada. Uh, unlike actually in the United Kingdom and, and, and many other jurisdictions is, is even uh, further complicated because we have centralized a lot of power in our premiers and prime ministers offices. Um, so uh, unless you have the backing of, of a sitting premier, no matter who it is, uh, whether it's PC, NDP or, or, or UCP, uh, as a cabinet minister, uh, your ability to, to make changes, significant changes to legislation are, are, are very, very minimal. 
So I would tell you that uh, some of the amendments, not all, but some of the amendments to labor law uh, that NDP has brought forward after our government, uh, I, I very much applaud it um, because they needed to be done earlier. But in, in, in the context of our cabinet, in the composition of our cabinet, that simply at that time would have been, uh, would have been impossible. See, PC party was a very unique party uh, because in our caucus, um, we had individuals um, who, to a very large extent, one would argue, would have been aligned with, with some of the NDP policies, definitely liberal policies. But on the other hand, uh, we had members and cabinet members who very well would be aligned with the UCP caucus right now. Um, so we, we really straddled uh, both, uh, both ends of the spectrum. I always argue that the best thing that ever happened to the PC party was the formation of the Wild Rose Party because that group uh, migrated from PC um, to, to Wild Rose, allowing us to make uh, much more pragmatic decisions. Uh, we weren't, we weren't uh, held back by those ultra, ultra right-wing um, uh, views. But, um, but when you have a, a party um, that, that is what's referred to as a big tent, um, you often compromise on both sides. And you know, our litmus test was always that if, uh, if labor unions were as upset with us as business owners, that means we're, we're doing a good job because you sort of try to find that, that happy medium. Great. Uh, uh, Dr. Joe, if you could unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Joe, I'm here, I'm here. Sorry, I was having some trouble with the, uh, the unmute. Um, Thomas, I confess I'm a little bit late to the uh, Lukasik fan club. I didn't really discover you until about three years ago. Um, and I've just been really impressed with your um, versatility, your, your ability to parse through the issues and to stand up for the right things. Um, and I'm just curious, what would, what conditions would have to exist for you to return to the political fray? First of all, uh, thank you. You're, uh, you're very kind. <laughs> uh, the, the first and, and primary condition is, uh, doctor, uh, you would have to sit down with my wife and convince her. And, uh, and that would not be an easy task. Um, I have to tell you, I've been elected almost uh, 15 years and then before that very actively involved in, um, in, in party politics. And um, I enjoyed every single, well, no, maybe I'm not being truthful now. I enjoyed a lot of moments of it, um, but it is exceptionally hard on the family. And, um, and I have a daughter who is now 21 years old and, and I literally haven't seen her grow up. I missed almost every single soccer game and, 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 and dance lessons and all that. Um, so, so putting myself through that again, uh, I, I still have that burning in the belly, but I know how difficult it would be on my, on my family. Uh, second of all, um, I would have a dilemma. If I wanted to re-enter Alberta politics, I honestly don't believe uh, where I would fit into this puzzle. I, I definitely could not function within the UCP caucus. That would be the shortest uh, lived political career you would have seen. Um, but I am not a good fit with NDP either. Thomas, thank you very much for this. This is really insightful. We'll look forward to having you back, Thomas, another day. Uh, this, uh, there's lots of stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, issues yet to unpack for this. So thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.